This is Taylor Mason, and I'm here today with Representative Joanna McClinton, who is currently the Democratic Leader of the House. This is an ongoing oral history project on the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus and its impact on members and staff. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Taylor, for having this interview. Uh, could you just tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got to the House of Representatives? Absolutely. So I have been serving in the House of Representatives since a special election in 2015. My immediate past job before running for this office was chief counsel to my state senator, Anthony Hardy Williams. Prior to that, I had been an assistant public defender at the Defender Association of Philadelphia for nearly a decade. And how I got here is a little bit unconventional. I was in my second full year of working in the Senate, and I enjoyed every minute of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd say it was the part of you know my transition from being in court to being in the legislature. It's just like everything's starting to resonate. And uh, unbeknownst to me, mm -hmm. my predecessor, and unfortunately several other members, resigned suddenly. Okay. And one of the days that I was in this same capital, my state senator asked me why I didn't speak up for myself. <laughs> and I said, you know, what are you talking about? And he said, I heard that you're interested in running and you haven't even mentioned it to me. And mm -hmm. I said, you know, I don't know that I'm interested in running at all. I said, you know, our coworkers, well, my coworkers at the time in the, in the district office were edging me on. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't something that I was interested in, honestly, so I didn't bring it up. And he let me know that if I decided to be interested, I could take off of work, of course, as I needed, to come to an interest meeting. Okay. And so I went to an interest meeting, fast forward, there were several other neighbors who expressed interest, and I uh, was the one, after doing more paperwork, we all filled out these different applications to be evaluated. Long story short, I was endorsed um, to be a candidate for a special election. You okay. know, it wasn't how I started the year off. It mm -hmm. wasn't anything I thought in the spring I'm gonna be doing this summer, yeah. but it really um, was me deciding that I needed to try. Although this wasn't on my goal list, even as an adult, I needed to try because I did learn in the public defender's office, in youth ministry, how to advocate for other people. And so I shouldn't sell myself short mm -hmm. just because I hadn't previously <laughs> been interested sure. in running for office. Sure. Um, what has been your experience being a person of color in the house? Do you think you've had any obstacles or extra hurdles to overcome when you were here or leading up to your time here? So the way I like to think about it is, you know, after I was able to be here for a full uh, year and a half, mm -hmm. I um, was fortunate enough to win again. And my mom came up for the large swearing in because I missed it the first time. Sure. And she heard from uh, predominantly, of course, my colleagues who are still at this moment mostly white men, how much they liked me, how much they respected me, how much they were glad that I was there and they got to become friends with me in a short time. Mm -hmm. And that swearing in day, January 2017, uh, really for me, you know, exemplifies what it's like for me to be a person of color in the house. I did not let the fact that I'm a double minority keep me from building a bridge with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle and certainly keep me from wanting to get to know people from different parts of the Commonwealth. Okay, well thank you for sharing that. Um, your district is very historic in terms of PLBC members. Um, you represent the 191st district, which has many famous, well-known former members. Um, what's it like being such of a a long line of succession of so many historic PLBC members. Well, it is a great deal of positive peer pressure. <laughs> so the first person who's most notable in that long line you're referencing is, of course, my senator's dad, Hardy Williams. Mm -hmm. Hardy Williams was an independent Democrat who ran against the party and was able to make history in the civil rights movement at a time where there were not African Americans in elected office, um, widespread, of course, n neither in Harrisburg or even in Philly, he was able to be historic with his first election, and he started a tradition of independent black Democrats who did not fit into the narrative of a party, but who fought for people and was able to do grassroots organizing. And I am blessed to still have constituents who helped get him elected in my district. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, they talk to me about the work he did. And of course, his son is our state senator who was also in the seat and he's still serving. But they talk to me especially about the dad who I did not 
have an opportunity to ever meet in my lifetime. Okay. But it's awesome. It's really awesome yeah. to know that there's such a great historic predecessor who, you know, literally tilled the ground fast forward 30 mm -hmm. something years for someone like me. Yeah. Do you have any stories about any of your predecessors? Anything unique that you'd like to share or any fun little anecdotes about them? Well, I'll tell you, you know, being able to work with one in particular, um, Senator Anthony Hardy Williams, mm -hmm. it's very exciting. And I don't know what the timing will be when you release this, but for this current point of reference, yesterday was the budget address. And of course, that's one of only two times that the Senate will come um, in a two year period, you yeah. know, to our chamber in full and to see the pride beaming from Senator Williams as he stood with me at the minority desk is just mm -hmm. very encouraging. Because although, like I said, I didn't meet his dad, you know, being able to work with him in the neighborhood, he's, I tell him he's my neighbor because he lives around the corner, but being his state rep, but also, you know, holding the, you know, doing something his mm -hmm. dad never got to do. And that when he was in the house, he never got to do. It's a really mm -hmm. important thing for our community. Yeah. Um, I also have Peter Truman and Samuel Ross, and you mentioned Hardy Williams and Ronald Waters. Do you, do you still stay in touch with any of them? Or? Absolutely. Spe specifically Ronald Waters. Okay. I have not had the pleasure of meeting anybody else she listed off, but State Representative Ronald Waters, a retiree who retired with so much grace and favor in the, the mind and eyes of voters. And I always say, if you know, I had to resign suddenly. I don't know that I could actively help someone running for my office yeah. that I previously <laughs> held, but Representative Ronald Waters continues to be a presence in our community, a person who's greatly respected, and the word that I have to use is a man full of grace. Because while he knew me as staff in the Senate, he didn't know me as a political candidate, and he didn't know me as someone who's aspiring to take his seat. But he really got very involved in my special election, and I'm confident that his involvement played a significant role. And in the first year especially, um, when I would have events, I mean, I continue to invite him, but we're in a pandemic right now. Sure, sure. <laughs> but particularly in the very beginning, you know, seniors said they could trust me because Ron trusted me. Okay. And so I am always going to be grateful for Ron's support and mm -hmm. endorsement of me and for him just coming out and what, what many others would describe a moment to be able to kind of, you know, fall to the background. He didn't do it. He stayed up front and stood on the front line and told people that he was still a voter in the district and he was going to vote for me and they should. Yeah, that's great. I haven't met too many people that have mentioned Ronald Waters yet, so that's really interesting. Um, going to your current position, you're the first African-American woman to represent your district, but also the first woman and African-American woman to represent, um, be the leader for the Democrats. So what is that experience like? Do you have any thoughts about that you'd like to share? So it has been a truly humbling opportunity for my colleagues to decide to choose that a woman should be in charge in the House and that I'm so grateful that they've decided to allow me to do it for this term. And in terms of thoughts, it's just an exciting challenge. It's an amazing opportunity. Uh, my goal every time I step on the floor of the house is to uplift their voices and their issues, to amplify their issues, to make sure that even with us being in a, a minority party, mm -hmm. that their issues are uplifted and that when I speak, I recognize now, I don't just get to speak for my neighbors, but I get to speak for my colleagues. And it's just really an exciting journey. And what makes me most excited is that very soon it won't be, you know, a first woman to do this or a first woman to do that. Like, it will be a normal thing <laughs> in Harrisburg. Yes. I, I was going to ask you, do you think this will open up more doors for more women and more um, people with diverse backgrounds to take on leadership roles? For sure, because when I ran the first time for a leadership spot, it was for caucus chair. Okay. And caucus is... Uh, can be a bit rowdy <laughs> and you know some of the members were saying you know how are you going to keep order how are you going to maintain and I just told them you've never had a woman try to keep order but you will see that women are gifted with order. a special <laughs> neck to be able to keep everybody calm and everybody in order and respecting each other yes. and I never was thinking I'm jumping from chair to leader of mm -hmm. course my predecessor here um, did not make it out of the last election. So the same thought I had as caucus chair, my whole goal was if I'm going to be in a room with a gavel with a room full of men, 
I'm going to show them a woman can run this room. And now, as a woman running this caucus, it's important that the women who, who are here now and the women who will come after all of us will be able to do this job. They will not be foreclosed mm -hmm. for anybody else because they'll be able to say, oh, we trusted this woman to do it, and she did a great job. Yeah, that's great. Um, moving into your Black Caucus service or with any involvement, unless there's something else you'd like to discuss before I transition. Okay. Um, so what has been your involvement with the Black Caucus in the past? Yes, so my Black Caucus involvement starts from being a Senate staff member. Okay. Because the senators, just like the state reps, are often busy during session days, I was glad to represent my member at Black Caucus events, okay. outings in Harrisburg, and especially things happening in the district. At the time that I was working for my state senator, um, Representative Waters was actually wrapping up Black Caucus, and then Representative Vanessa Lowry-Brown was in charge of Black Caucus from the time I was staff until I came over here as a member of hers mm -hmm. in the House. And it was always and continues to be an incredible collective of people who have a variety of ideas and opinions, but have shared goals of service and of really making sure policies positively impact folks, okay. especially folks of color. Yeah. Um, we mentioned some former members from your current district, but do you keep in touch with any former members from outside the 191st? For sure. Uh, I just mentioned one, State Rep. Vanessa Lowry-Brown. Okay. She is in the district neighboring me. Um, I also uh, get in touch with the first black woman to ever join leadership in the House, Representative Rosita C. Youngblood. Okay. I still talk to her quite a bit. Uh, Chairman Curtis Thomas, who's now is about four years into retirement. I um, you know, don't, of course, get to talk to many people with regularity just because of the schedule. But it is not uncommon for them to see my name pop up on their phones or vice versa. That's great. So what are some legislative issues the Black Caucus has had to work on in the past and maybe some things you'd like to see in the future? So in the past, the Black Caucus, I think my favorite chairman, I'm a little biased, <laughs> um, is, you know, when I wasn't in leadership was State Representative Jordan Harris. Um, Jordan worked really, really hard during the governor's administration to make sure that the issue of gun violence was not swept to the side and that it was not figuring, uh, was not taken as another issue that can't be tackled. Um, what Jordan was able to do as Black Caucus Chair, he had the governor come down for a round table, hearing directly from medical professionals, funeral, funeral directors, and mothers of uh, victims. And because of that one town hall he held as Black Caucus Chair in his district, that budget cycle, we were able to start getting the funding we now like are able to like elaborate on mm -hmm. to tackle this issue, not just in Philadelphia, but yeah. everywhere. Um, I will say Representative Donna Bullock has done an excellent job of making sure that voting rights is at the forefront of her legislative agenda for the members in the caucus. And because of their strong voices, we were able to have meetings very early on when so many legislative leaders unfortunately tried to throw our votes out from the 2020 election and just be able to combat the notion that we could not trust our electoral process. So um, how has the PLBC impacted your overall house service? Oh, it's made it very, very positive. Um, I think about the years that I was a student at LaSalle, a very small private Catholic college, but it was predominantly white. And I was always able to have friends with everybody, just like here. Mm -hmm. But it was also exciting to know I was a member of the African American Student League. As a law student at Villanova, I was also similarly able to, you know, be friends with some of my current colleagues, Representative Jared Solomon, the Budget Secretary Greg Paul. But it was amazing to be a member of the Black Law Students Association. As a state lawmaker, it's awesome to know that there is an affinity group with people of color who are deep down in the minority out of 253 people. And we're able to talk about our districts. We're able to talk about collaborating on policy. Mm -hmm. And we're also able at the appropriate times to you know, have social affairs, to have black history programs and things of that nature. So it's awesome. Yeah. Um, I brought a picture. I've been sharing this with other members. Just to get your thoughts, if anything comes to mind about these former members, um, anything that comes to mind while you're looking at these members. So the first one is David P. Richardson. <laughs> Every single person, you know, in my district and beyond, he didn't serve my district, he was mm -hmm. in another part of the city. They continue in 2022 to talk about 
David P. Richardson being a voice like none other in Harrisburg. Someone who was able to always be boldly, unapologetically African American, black, talking about black people, black issues, and making sure that these issues were not, uh, you know, taken to mm -hmm. the wayside, but that they were taken up. He is the person that I hear about always and everywhere. And then I see Hardy Williams, yeah. the great <laughs> Hardy Williams. I saw Dave first because he's on the first row, but I see Hardy Williams. And I think about, you know, all that he did, the number of young people that Hardy was a mentor to. So many are lawyers now, some mm -hmm. are in office, some are, you know, running companies. His hand of influence to the generation of folks that come up in the 80s and the 90s and even up into Representative Jordan Harris, who yes. was an intern, mm -hmm. is phenomenally incredible. And then, of course, I see the speaker himself, the only <laughs> person of color to, you know, ascend, I'm sure. Um, I'm sitting in his office right now. I have a picture of him framed that's not hung yet. Someone just gave me for Christmas. Oh, that's uh, nice. You know, I see Speaker <laughs> Kaylee Roy Irvis and all that he means. Everybody tells me that while Dave Richardson was the fighter and able to challenge everything, that Speaker Irvis was the most articulate member of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives to ever serve. Uh, so I'm excited about it. <laughs> and then I'll end because I, I don't recognize everyone. Sure, yeah. I'll end with my congressman. Congressman <laughs> Dwight Evans, I see, is also on the front row. And I know that Dwight uh, was able to be historical with his service as a appropriations chair for, mm -hmm. you know, over two decades, um, but doing a job that he was able to build relationships across the Commonwealth and really help people have mm -hmm. access to capital um, when they had worthy projects. So this picture is awesome. You're welcome to keep that if you would oh, like it. Thank you. Um, I've been trying to use that as a conversation starter if we have any uh, topics there. But those are my questions, unless there's anything else you would like to discuss. No, thanks. No? Okay, then we'll end there. Thank you.